Welcome to Advanced Manufacturing Media's webinar series. My name is Patrick Wozniak, Senior Editor of Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which is part of SME's Advanced Manufacturing Media. I'm very excited to host today's webinar, Femtosecond Lasers, opening a whole new world. window of laser processing with Ronald D. Schaefer, CEO of Photo Machining Incorporated. Our sponsors are Epilog, Gravotech, LaserMech, REM Sales Sugami, Rofin Basel, Trump, GMTA, IPG Photonics, BLM Group USA, and Murata. At Manufacturing Engineering, we're increasingly focused on the role of lasers in, the, in manufacturing with our laser channel on our website at advancedmanufacturing.org. You can find the content from our spe laser special section, which was published in July, there as well. Ron is a member of SME's Industrial Laser Community, which is one of the great resources we have here at SME, a highly knowledgeable community of experts. You'll be able to ask questions of, after Ron's presentation using the Q&A box that will appear at the right side of the screen. Time permitting, these will be answered following the presentation. If time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we'll make sure the answers are emailed to you. And with that, I'll pr pass the presentation over to Ron. Thank you, Pat. Um, this is Ron Schaefer, and I'm going to be talking to you for about the next 40 minutes about femtosecond lasers and why femtosecond lasers are so cool and so interesting. Uh, first, I want to thank the folks for at SME and Manufacturing Engineering for putting on this uh, seminar. Uh, I'm basically a, a troubadour going around and singing the praises of lasers and especially short pulse and short wavelength lasers. So basically, um, I've been in this business for a long time. I am on the editorial board for Industrial Laser Solutions, and I do a frequent blog on the Industrial Laser Solutions website. I've been a columnist for Micro Manufacturing Magazine since the beginning of the magazine. I've been working with lasers for over 25 years and published uh, over 150 articles. So I've been involved in this uh, especially high precision range, uh, field for a long time. I am the CEO of a company called Photo Machining. We're in New Hampshire, and in particular, we do job shop services, and we build custom laser-based systems, mostly around ultraviolet and USP lasers. So the talk outline. First, I'd like to introduce you to a few things about lasers. Secondly, I'm going to make some comments on especially USP, which is ultra short pulse lasers, and especially within that group, femtosecond lasers. Next, I'm going to talk about beam delivery, and that's getting the photons from the laser to the workpiece and conditioning them along the way. I'm going to make a little bit of a comment about some other systems components that are needed to make a full system. I'll talk a little bit about markets and applications, and then we'll go into a conclusion. At the end of the conclusion, like Pat said, you'll have a chance to ask questions, and I'll try to field the questions as best I can. Uh, if you have any questions afterwards, you feel free to contact me. My contact information is on the slides. And people normally ask me if this uh, is available. I believe uh, it will be archived on the SME website, so you will be able to download the presentation if you desire. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about lasers. When we talk about lasers, we talk about several things that are very important. The first one is repetition rate. The repetition rate is the number of pulses that the laser puts out per second, basically. And the spacing of those pulses is the inverse. And so generally, we work at about uh, a couple of tens of kilohertz to a couple of hundred kilohertz pulse repetition rate. Although especially for USP lasers, these lasers can run at tens of megahertz. Unfortunately, a very high pulse repetition rate is not so useful in most micromachining applications because we simply can't move the beam fast enough. So repetition rate is one thing that we like to talk about, and it's very important. The next thing is pulse length, and that's the whole point of this presentation. The shorter the pulse length, the better the laser is for micromachining applications, and the shorter the pulse length, 
uh, certain things can happen that don't happen with longer pulse length lasers. So the pulse length, the time of the laser pulse, each laser pulse, there is a rise time and a fall time associated with it. Uh, tails are common, so usually there's a fairly fast rise time like you see on the diagram, and then somewhat of a tail. And as I said, shorter pulses in general are better for micromachining, and longer pulses in, battle, uh, in general are better for things like welding. The final thing I want to talk about is wavelength. Each laser has a certain color of light, and the color or wavelength of that laser determines where it emits in the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's very important because ultraviolet lasers actually have enough photon energy to um, interact with the electronic bonds in most molecules, whereas infrared photons basically impart their uh, energy to the material by thermal mechanisms. So they heat the material up. So first of all, why should we use ultraviolet lasers? Ultraviolet lasers have a short wavelength, less than 400 nanometers. They generally have a short pulse duration, which is less than 100 nanoseconds or say. Uh, no, say I, or you can see I said short, not ultra short. Uh, and they have fairly high peak powers. Now the UV lasers uh, have a material photon interaction that's within a very shallow absorption depth. So typically a UV laser will react with the material within fractions of a micron of the surface. And what this means is that uh, the, you can get very small feature sizes and you can also get very precise ablation. Also, since it inter interacts with chemical bonds, especially in pi electron clouds, the UV bond breaking can occur rather than simply thermally heating the material. Now, infrared lasers, on the other hand, have a long wavelength, greater than one micron. They have a long pulse duration. For instance, CO2 lasers have pulse durations in the millisecond to microsecond range. But they are very high commercially available peak powers and also uh, average powers coming out of these lasers. And they've been around for quite a long time. Infrared lasers in general have a long wavelength and that allows for the photon material interaction to be much higher of an absorption depth. So there's more penetration per pulse with infrared lasers into the material than there is with UV lasers. Because you can get higher uh, pulse energy with these lasers, you can do larger feature sizes. And even if you try to get the smallest feature size, because of the wavelength, you're limited uh, in terms of the smallest feature you can get. They are very good for thermal material removal. The lasers are very good for material joining in a thermal way, and also thermal material deposition. So that kind of brackets the wavelength in between the infrared and the ultraviolet. The next graph that I show you uh, has wavelength and pulse duration. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the red um, oval that says welding. That's an infrared laser with a long wavelength, and those lasers are good for applications which require a lot of thermal input. If you look on the uh, y-axis down towards the origin where it says femtosecond and UV, uh, this is the area where it's extremely good for micromachining because you have a short pulse length and you have a short wavelength. Basically, the anywhere below about 50 nanoseconds or 100 nanoseconds in the UV up going into the infrared is used in micromachining applications, but the shorter the pulse length, the better the results on target and the more interesting some of the applications, as we'll see as we go on. Okay, short pulse lasers in general. Let's say short is relative. So... When we say short or ultra short, we usually mean lasers with a pulse length of less than one nanosecond. And this includes the picosecond and the femtosecond lasers. Picosecond are 10 to the minus 12 seconds, femtosecond 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So take a zero, put a period on the right hand side, add 15 zeros and a one, and you have one femtosecond. A very, very, very short period of time. Potentially, it includes even shorter pulse length lasers, but below 150 femtoseconds, the optics become very challenging to use, especially in an industrial environment. And there really isn't much reason to go much shorter for most applications. So I typically um, say about 150 femtoseconds is the shortest we need to consider right now. But even with low pulse energy, because you have these very short pulses, you have extremely high peak powers. And if you focus the laser to a small spot, 
the peak power intensity is huge, and that's still the key. So in the best case, to get the best processing, you want high pulse energy, short pulse length, and a small spot size, and that gives you extremely high peak power intensity on target. Okay, some of the advantages of USP lasers, especially femtosecond lasers, they open up a whole wide range of applications that can't be accessed with longer pulse length lasers. There's somewhat of a wavelength independent absorption, even in otherwise transparent materials, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, generally, at about 10 picoseconds, you do not see this wavelength independence. You can definitely see a difference in the processing between the fundamental, the doubled, and the tripled wavelength, for instance. But when you're around two to 300 femtoseconds in most materials, you don't see much of a difference, if you see any difference at all, in the processing quality between the three wavelengths. Uh, because of the short pulse length, it's basically a non-thermal interaction and it's ablation. There's virtually no heat affected zone, no micro cracking. The femtosecond lasers, because of their high peak powers and because of their broadband nature, can do things that are not possible with other lasers. And the cool thing about these lasers is that the laser development is moving fast, very rapidly. Now, the lasers that we typically use in micromachining applications, I say that they should have a single pulse energy of 50 microjoules or more. And because of the high peak power and the short uh, pulse length, 25 uh, microjoules is, is, is okay for femtosecond lasers. So minimum of 25 microjoules per pulse in a machining laser. Typically, you have about 100 kilohertz repetition rate. That's 100,000 pulses per second. Um, typically, it's used between, let's say, 100 kilohertz and 1 megahertz. Very rarely do we use more than 1 megahertz repetition rate unless we use some other uh, beam delivery application, which is fast enough to uh, allow that kind of high repetition rate. Um, however, the power of the laser should be usable power, not too high of a repetition rate and not too uh, low of a pulse rate energy. Because people will come to me many times and say, hey, I've got a 100-watt laser. But if that 100-watt laser is running at uh, a couple of hundred megahertz with only uh, microjoules of energy per pulse, it's really not good for micromachining. And then the, other, the last thing is that the laser has to be somewhat industrial, whatever that means. It's got to be reliable. It's got to have uh, low uh, or long times between maintenance and that sort of thing. So here is a graph that I made just about one year ago um, involving femtosecond lasers, and this was an updated table that I did from the year before, 2013, showing femtosecond laser manufacturers and what their specifications are. Now, there are some people missing from this table, um, some of whom I just didn't know about or didn't get to, some of whom uh, didn't fill out uh, the questionnaire that I gave them, but the po folks that are on this table filled out the questionnaire. You can see the specifications. Now, I'll go to the next slide and just talk about what's been updated uh, in the last year or so or what's been on the, the word on the street, as I call it. The big thing is that you'll see on the last slide that it says gone for Radiance. Uh, Radiance was one of the uh, first femtosecond companies that really made it big industrially, but uh, for whatever reason, their business uh, model did not work, and even though they've got a lot of lasers in the field, they ceased to exist as a company uh, this year. Their assets were acquired by Coherent, and I don't know the exact story, but I know people have been calling me and saying, what do we do with these lasers now that we can't get them serviced anymore? Um, I think there's a, a short grace period, and after which the lasers will just not be serviced. But that's something between uh, the new owners of the uh, assets, Coherent, and the owners of the lasers in the field. Um, Rofen was using these, ro these Radiance lasers at one time. Uh, now, as far as I know, they're now using light conversion lasers as the box or the engine inside their box, which is kind of interesting. I try to keep this, uh, these seminars objective wherever possible, but uh, from my own personal experience, the light conversion laser is a very good femtosecond laser. It's very robust. And honestly, I've had several of my colleagues who are selling competitive lasers tell me that, in general, from the point of view of reliability, specifications, price, and everything else, that really the light conversion laser is the laser to beat on the market. Uh, I've heard some things about Gen Optic possibly backing off of the U.S. market maybe or losing some interest in the USP market. Not sure about that. That's something fairly new. A new company has come on that I've become aware of, FiberCrist. Uh, this company from France has a new amplifier technology based on single crystal fibers. 
and they say that they're going to be making very uh, robust lasers at a very good price. I guess we'll see what happens. So some general observations on the femtosecond lasers. At 300 femtoseconds, as I said earlier, there's a little, very little difference in the quality between, for instance, the fundamental, the doubled, and the third harmonic in most materials, especially metals. However, in some materials like glass and polymers, uh, it's still best processed with the UV. And even though the femtosecond is usually a better choice for quality, probably the majority of applications today, picosecond lasers will do. And picosecond lasers, you get more watts per dollar, so you can use a picosecond laser instead of a femto. But fortunately, there's a lot of applications where you need to use femtosecond lasers. The third point is that, in any case, UV photons give a smaller spot size. So even if you have a femtosecond laser running at, say, 300 femtoseconds pulse length, and you're working in the fundamental, you're limited on the minimum achievable spot size by staying in the fundamental. If you go to the frequency tripled wavelength of a fundamental laser, you'll get less energy per pulse, but you will also be able to get a much smaller spot size. So in principle, your peak power intensity on target could even be higher. One thing you've got to be careful about, though, is air breakdown, especially with USP lasers where you're working with the UV and where you're working with short uh, focal length lenses. Air breakdown can be a problem, and if you have too high of an energy per pulse, uh, this is not always a good thing. So uh, higher energy per pulse it does have its limits. Now let's just talk about general Gaussian beam efficiency. All of the lasers that I'm aware of have, in general, a Gaussian-type beam. I should say the, the short pulse lasers, or ultra-short pulse lasers, that is. This is simple mathematics. If you look at a Gaussian beam, you find that really only the central portion of the Gaussian beam is actually effectively doing material processing. And this is important because when you pay a lot of money for photons, like femtosecond photons, you want to be able to effectively use these photons and not throw a lot of them away, or in the worst case, have the photons do something that they shouldn't be doing. And so when you look at IH, which is on the graph, IH uh, is a, something, uh, some proportion of the intensity max, and that's basically what we call the ablation threshold. And so anything below or anything within that box is doing efficient processing. Above that box, you're still processing, but you have more uh, photon energy than you really need to do the job, so there's some excess which cause, causes side effects. And in the wings, you're not really doing any processing at all, so that's actually just excess energy that's being ineffectively used. And here's a key to the previous slide. Um, you can read through that, but like I said, the point is that you're ineffectively using uh, a good percentage of this Gaussian beam. And so one of the ways to do this is to change the beam. So as a general rule, the Gaussian laser beam has a maximum beam utilization of about 37% only. Uh, even if you consider the excess energy above the ablation threshold, you're still looking at uh, about a 50% um, beam utilization factor. So. If you want to get 50% more photons on target, you can either pay a lot more for a bigger laser, or you can do something like beam shaping. And this is just one example of a refractive beam shaping optic, which turns a Gaussian beam basically into a flat top beam that is more efficient for processing. There are other ways to increase the beam efficiency. The uh, first one is, sorry about that, the first one is to possibly use diffractive optics. Diffractive optics actually have a machined optic which takes the incident beam and does something to it. And what my definition of this is like an optical shower head. All the water comes in uh, kind of collimated, but it also only goes out certain holes. The one that's showing on the screen is an interesting application where you can take it and have uh, the incoming beam focus at three different fo focal points. And when you focus the three different focal points, it's actually quite interesting for making a line in something or for cutting, for instance, glass. So just another clever way of using these, uh, these photons and getting more beam utilization efficiency. Some general comments on the beam delivery. The transmissive optics are key. And because of the short pulse length and especially the short wavelength, BK7 or similar materials cause thermal distortion. So 
you need to really go with fused silica for all your optics. You need to be careful of your optics because if there's anything in the beam path, like uh, beam splitters or wave plates that have glue, you're going to uh, toast the glue and toast the optics. You want to use a highly expanded beam to steer through the turning optics so that you can avoid mirror damage. You want to avoid back reflections, especially in multi-element lenses like Galvos. You may need to purge the beam path, uh, and that's especially true for short pulse UV wavelengths. And in order to take uh, advantage of some of these very high repetition rates that are possible, better electronic control needs to be used for high-speed processing. All right, let's look at some beam delivery applications that are kind of special for femtosecond processing. The first one is this, fiber laser delivery. Can we get an ultra-fast laser beam through a fiber optic and delivered to the part? This is very important for industrial-type applications. Um, basically, all ultra-fast systems today use free space delivery. And just recently, a lot of been, uh, talk has been uh, Talks have been made about how to get this uh, short wavelength and short pulse length light into fibers. Now, fiber specifications, they have to be flexible and robust, yes. That means a fiber optic delivery system. Uh, they have to be meters long, so that means you have to have low propagation losses. They have to have a high energy transport, so you have to have a high damage threshold. They have to maintain their short pulse duration so that you don't get a longer pulse out of the fiber, and that means uh, proper dispersion control and you have to maintain the beam quality as it propagates through the fiber. So can we actually do this? Uh, the answer is, within the last year, a company in Germany called Photonics Tools has been working with Amplitude and some French companies and have actually launched a new product uh, where they can couple femtosecond light into their system and use the fiber optic to transport the beam. They've done this for the um, fundamental wavelength at energies per pulse up to a millijoule and at uh, powers I think up to about 100 watts or so. As far as I'm aware they have not used the UV yet but if you look at the next slide you can see that the types of uh, fibers you're using are essentially hollow core fibers and there's different types of microstructures in these different fiber core or hollow core fibers that can give you different profiles if you want. And essentially, because they're high, uh, hollow core fibers, there's really no reason why it wouldn't work for uh, other wavelengths. So this could be a very powerful tool um, moving forward for these USP laser deliveries. Another technique that takes advantage of the high repetition rate is polygon scanning. Generally, galvanometers are used for scanning the laser beam in most applications, but when you get up to about a megahertz, the galvanometers are too slow. So polygon scanning is possible. Um, using reflective optics, they can get speeds of about 100 meters per second, which are 10 times the speed of the galvo as it's present. However, they're somewhat restrictive and they're not for all applications. And like I said, the all reflective optics uh, can be somewhat limiting. If you take the next step and combine the polygon scanning with Galvo scanning, you can go to an even higher um, per, or pulse repetition rate and use it. And so if you're really interested in this, uh, the, you can see at the bottom of the screen there's a YouTube uh, reference where you can see this being done in real time. All right, let's talk about some special applications which are only possible with femtosecond lasers. The first one is called micromachining with SSTF, which is simultaneous spatial and temporal focusing. This has to, or this relies on the fact that when you get a short, short pulse, you have a very large bandwidth uh, as far as the uh, wavelength. So you have a very large uh, wavelength range, and if you put the short pulse into a grating, you're going to see a large wavelength range. If you then use this large wavelength, and because, by the way, you've put it through a grating, you no longer have it all combined in a single wavelength, that means you've stretched the pulse. So you've basically stretched the pulse uh, spatially. And then you put it through your optical system. You go through another grating, which recombines the pulse. You focus it onto the sample. So it is only at the focus that you actually have everything coming together and it becomes a femtosecond uh, spot again. 
So on the top, you can see the singlet beam with focus. focus. That's without SSTF. And essentially what you're getting going through that particular uh, medium is you're seeing a line. Whereas if you look at the bottom one, when the, with the SSTF focus, you're seeing all the colors go in and only at the center are they actually doing ablating. It's quite a powerful technique. Uh, you can see here again in the next slide that you have the light coming in. On the top you have the non-SSTF light, which is uh, fil filamented all the way through. And on the bottom you have the SSTF light where it is only at the focal point that you actually see the, uh, the ablation taking place. This is also really cool for using on transparent materials and backside ablation. You focus on the back side of the material and you process from the back side instead of on the front side, which gives you all kinds of uh, um, options as far as keeping the de debris free and so on because the debris falls off. I just wanted to mention that this topic is actually going to be presented next week at the Akalio Conference in Atlanta. Uh, the talk will be uh, by Professor Jeff Squire as an invited talk on Monday, October 19th at 1.30. So um, if you're going to that conference, you might want to uh, see that talk and a lot of other talks related to femtosecond and USP laser processing. Now, another interesting application for femtosecond lasers is femtosecond irradiation followed by chemical etching, where you're actually not ablating the material, but you're changing the structure of the material. Several groups are doing this. Uh, Fraunhofer ILT in Aachen, uh, they're doing what's called ISLE, in situ laser or in situ selective laser etching, or sometimes called just SLE, selective laser etching. Cambridge University is doing what they call FLICE, which is femtosecond laser irradiation and chemical etching. And then a spin-off from ILT called Laser Light Fab is commercializing this technology and promoting this technology and selling um, galvo heads that are specifically made to do this. And what it involves is basically taking the, let's say, transparent material like glass, sapphire, or whatever, essentially writing a pattern into this material, a 3D pattern, starting at the bottom and working up, and then putting it in some sort of a acid or caustic bath so that it gets etched out. So it is a two-step process. It does involve chemical etching, but you can get some unbelievable, beautiful results. Um, a couple of examples. On the left, you see some gears etched from one millimeter thick fused silica. These were made with the ISLE technique, acid etched, and basically they fall right out as you see them. On the right hand, you see some 3D microfluidic chips in glass. Microfluidics is a huge field that's going to open up in the next few, uh, few years, and this could be just the technology that will help to uh, drive this field forward. Some more examples. We have um, holes cut in fused silica of about one millimeter thickness. Now, I was actually dealing with a customer who asked us if we could drill, I don't remember the number, some, some number of tens of thousands of holes in a one millimeter thick piece of fused silica for a microelectronics application. If we were to do that with our lasers, it would have taken something like 40 days. With this technique, we can calculate that we can expose the whole wafer in something like 16 hours and then throw it in an acid bath overnight and out come all the holes. One thing nice about this technique is that whether you have one hole or a million holes, the acid bath time takes exactly the same. So you're, it's not a serial process like drilling all the holes is. Another microfluidic uh, infused silica glass. Again, this microfluidics field, a lot of different patterns for a lot of different kinds of things, such as labs on a chip. Uh, big, big application area, we think, in glass. Now, in addition to the laser and the motion control, you have to have some other things. The other things include XYZ, theta motion, part viewing, uh, systems packaging, it has to be class one, and safety, laser support systems, and software to run everything. So there's a lot more that goes into the system than just the laser and the beam delivery, but we don't have time to talk about all of that. I just want you to make, make you aware that there are many other things besides. People typically ask me about the cost. So 
basically, here's the cost. For a picosecond, a femtosecond laser, you're looking at about, let's say, $11,000 per watt in the IR for pico and $20,000 per watt in the IR for femto. And these are all very general numbers. Uh, in the tripled wavelength, you're probably looking at about $66,000 per watt in the pico and $100,000 per watt in the femto. Again, very general numbers, and by the way, these numbers are going down all the time because every year you can buy more photons for less money in the USP realm. To give you a general uh, yardstick, a nanosecond laser of the same type will typically cost between fifty dollars and $100,000, depending on the power output. And the picosecond lasers go for about $150,000 to $200,000. The femtosecond lasers are about $250,000 to $300,000, all very general, again, and depending on the manufacturer. The, kit, the system costs. The laser, in this case, is frequently the highest cost item, and that's especially true if for a UV and a USB laser. The system cost includes the beam delivery components, the motion components, the utilities, the uh, AC distribution, cameras also, things like shipping, delivery, warranty, service, maintenance, contracts, and that sort of thing. Okay, so comments on markets. First of all, right now, Sapphire is really hot, and it's consuming a lot of the high-power USB lasers being built today, most picosecond, but also a lot of femtosecond lasers. Uh, communications gen devices in general and um, tablets and screens and things like that. Number two, glass processing in general is very hot. And when I say glass, I mean uh, transparent, hard, brittle materials, including sapphire and things like that. Very hot for femtosecond lasers, for circuit boards, for medical devices, for displays, uh, for other things. Fuel injector nozzles for increased fuel economy and uh, reduced emissions. Actually, Radiance had a pretty good uh, foot into this market at one time. We're still using short pulse lasers for multilayer solar cells to improve the efficiency. As I said earlier, microfluidics, one of the big growth areas, and also for other medical applications such as stents, especially bioabsorbable stents, uh, catheters, paraline removal, cancer diagnostics, cell fit filters, um, and a host of other things. Some requirements and trends in the device fabrication industry these days, um, accuracy, miniaturization, repeatability, impact on material, or hopefully no impact, post-processing, or again, hopefully none, Automation, traceability, cost reduction, and compliance. All these things are necessary in many of the application areas, especially things like defense, aerospace, and medical devices. But all of these things are very achievable with ultra-short pulse lasers and especially femtosecond lasers. Okay, so let's look at some specific applications. As I said, uh, USP lasers are being used now to make stents. Um, you can make stents with actually a fairly inexpensive uh, IR fiber laser, but those stents require a lot of post-processing. When you use femtosecond lasers, generally the stents can be made to a much finer uh, tolerance, and they don't require post-processing, or at least not as much post-processing. However, when you talk about polymeric stents or bioabsorbable stents, these cannot be made with an infrared laser. Uh, you'll see some images there of some stents that were made with femtosecond lasers. These things are made to dissolve in the body, so they're very sensitive to moisture. They're very sensitive to heat. And so, therefore, if they're sensitive to heat, you can't use a hot laser. You have to use a very short pulse laser, in this case a femtosecond laser, uh, to process these materials cleanly. And also because they're um, not really great friends of water or great friends of uh, heat, you can't really do any post-processing on them uh, or you destroy the stent. So a great application area for femtosecond lasers and one that's going to see a lot of rise in the future, near future. Some other application areas, paraline removal. You can remove paraline with other lasers like nanosecond UV, but you get a lot of charring behind. Um, here's an example, just some things we've done in the lab recently that I thought would be interesting. This is a 250 micron diameter wire coated with paraline. In the next photograph, you'll see that we've removed the paraline just from the tip of that wire. And then in the next photograph, what we've done is we've removed paraline from a place on the wire, and then we've cut the wire. So with the same laser, same application, all we can remove the paraline from the tip, go back, remove it from another area so you have electrical contact, and then cut the piece and um, make, it, make it the size. One laser does all three jobs. And by the way, 
All of these photos that I'm showing you are directly off the laser. Nothing was post-processed. So there was no cleaning or anything on these photos. This is stainless steel drilling. Here's an entrance hole, which just shows a little bit of debris around the outside, and I would suggest to you that that will wipe right off. On the lower left side, you'll see the exit hole, and that exit hole is really fairly clean. That's a 50 micron diameter exit hole in thin stainless steel that was processed with the fundamental femtosecond wavelength, 300 femtosecond pulse length. Now, I put that uh, photo again on the right side. On the left-hand side is a 50-micron hole that was electro-polished after it was drilled with a nanosecond UV laser. And you can see that the femtosecond laser quality, and don't, don't concentrate on those two little dark images on the side. Again, those will wipe right off. But you can see the edge quality is basically about the same as the electro-polished hole, and there was no post-processing done on this piece. And by the way, I should also point out that that particular job, uh, we're drilling something like 2,000 holes within plus or minus one micron diameter tolerance, and we're consistently able to deliver that kind of quality. And by the way, when you get down to the micron type level, plus or minus one micron, if there's any kind of uh, thermal effects on the edges, you will see that. You will not be able to maintain any kind of a micron-type tolerance. You can only do that with a femtosecond laser. Another one, uh, titanium metal cutting. You can see on the right-hand side what happens when you use a UV nanosecond laser and what happens when you use a fundamental picosecond laser. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look very closely, you can see that there's some uh, some burning along the edges in both cases. If the femtosecond laser is used to make the same cut, you see that the edge is basically pristine. Here's another interesting application. This is ceramic surface etching to create a surface structure. These trenches are 7 micron wide and about 60 nanometers in depth. We can't even measure them on our microscope. We have to use an interferometer. And you can see that the, uh, the consistency and the quality, again, no post-process at all uh, it is just fantastic. This is more surface structuring. This is silicon carbide using the UV wavelength. And this was a spiral etched into the surface of silicon carbide. Again, extremely clean, very nice material removal. And it's uh, made by using a 3D galvo developed at Laser Micro in California. Another application area is drilling glass, drilling holes in glass. This one happens to show some five micron diameter vias in some very thin glass. And this is a glass capillary, so on the right you'll see what the holes look like from the side. This is an older picture that was done by uh, Clark. Bill Clark uh, from Clark MXR gave me this picture a few years ago, but it's still uh, valid. On the Right-hand side, you'll see what happens when you try to drill a 100 micron diameter hole with a nanosecond laser. On the left-hand side, you'll see what happens when you drill with a femtosecond laser. Quite a big difference. Glass marking is also possible. Uh, unfortunately, this picture doesn't really do this, the mark on this glass justice. It's much, much cleaner and nicer than it even appears in this picture. But even in the picture, you can see there's absolutely no micro-cracking or any kind of compromise of the glass. And in fact, I would suggest to you that this glass marking is actually done inside the glass. In fact, here's a, an application, or here's a picture from the folks at Amplitude where they're actually marking a 2D uh, barcode inside the bulk of the glass, uh, which is very cool because then you're not going to compromise the quality of the uh, mark or you're not going to compromise the uh, mechanical integrity of the glass bottle. Another application area for these short pulse lasers is working on interocular lenses. You can see on the top left uh, the two photos that show the edge quality of the interocular lens uh, as it comes right off the femtosecond laser. Um, no burning, no thermal distortion, nothing visible. More surface structuring on metal. Um, this surface structuring can be used to create structures, as you see on the left, which makes materials hydrophobic. 
again, as you see on the top left. They repel water. So you can take a material that doesn't repel water, use a femtosecond laser to structure the surface, and voila, it will repel water. This is machining uh, titanium, or excuse me, this is machining um, tungsten carbide with a tie sapphire laser running at about 30 femtoseconds. Uh, this is shorter than the pulse lengths that we usually use, but uh, there's no reason we can't use it. Uh, as I said, typically, though, in an industrial application, you'll see more like 150 femtoseconds or higher in pulse length. Again, machining some other materials, hast alloy and titanium, with a short pulse laser. And you can see that in both cases, you're getting a pristine, uh, pristine um, cut or a drill. Teflon. Teflon is an interesting material because it doesn't really work well with other uh, UV lasers, certainly not with nanosecond UV lasers. On the left-hand side, you can see what happens when we use a 355 nanometer nanosecond laser. It doesn't cut it at all. It just kind of melts it. Uh, at 300 femtoseconds, with, with essentially the same wavelength, you get an absolutely beautiful cut. Okay, so some comments on the markets. Sapphire is really hot consuming most of the laser power, fuel injector nozzles, all this other stuff, like I said. This is, this is stuff that's going somewhere in the next few years, right? Final thoughts. First of all, there's a big drive to reduce the manufacturing costs of ultra-short pulse lasers, and the market is starting to mature. Now, that means the market is maturing. That doesn't mean the applications area are maturing. I think the, market, the lasers are maturing faster than the applications areas, so there's a wide range of application areas that are just opening up. Uh, lots of new players coming into the field all the time, so lots of new choices, and it'll be driving the costs down on a dollar per watt basis. I want to emphasize, you can spend an inordinate amount on the fanciest laser imaginable, but if you don't use it correctly, you will not get good results. So you need to have good beam delivery, you need to have good ancillary equipment, and you need to know what you're doing. Uh, getting the photons to the work area efficiently is very key to affordable femtosecond processing. And because of the unique nature, femtosecond lasers allow for some interesting beam delivery techniques and application techniques that are not possible using other lasers. And if you really want to learn more about lasers, uh, I'm teaching my course, which is an eight-hour course called Precision Laser Micromachining at the um, SPIE Photonics West show and in session SC689. And if you really, really want to know a lot more and you don't want to wait till January, uh, my book, Fundamentals of Laser Micromachining, is available from CRC Press uh, or from Amazon. And um, if you see me at a conference, I'll even autograph it for you. So, in conclusion, I want to thank our sponsors, Manufacturing Engineering, and all of my many colleagues in the laser industry were, were kind enough to provide their valuable input. Um, and I'm sure I've forgotten to mention uh, many of them, but some of my colleagues include uh, Chris Wood and Jeff Squire for the SSTF stuff, Eric Motte and Bjorn Vadel for the fiber optic stuff, Alexander Laskin for the uh, treatise on the uh, Gaussian beam, Gary Ferment for his uh, contributions to the figures, uh, Bill Clark for his uh, figure on the glass processing, and also to my team of application scientists and engineers here at Photo Machining who basically do all the real work while I get to talk about it. And thank you for attending this webinar. I think I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ron, for that informative session. As Ron has shown, laser, industrial laser use continues to become more advanced and useful for a wide variety of applications. We're going to try to get in a few questions here. And if for some reason we don't get to you, your question will be answered via email. Ron, here's the first one. Are laser drilling speeds comparable to conventional laser drilling? Um, well, okay. First of all, let's qualify that. Let's assume that you're talking about the same wavelength and the same uh, basically average power laser. If you make that assumption, then they're basically similar. However, because of the high peak powers, in many cases you can actually get faster processing with the femtosecond laser than you can with the longer pulse lasers. The thing is, though, the assumption that I made uh, in the beginning, generally um, the femtosecond lasers have less power 
than is available in the longer pulse lasers. Would picosecond or femtosecond laser be a good application for laser cleaning? We are interested in cleaning rotating turbine components, but would like to avoid any recast layer. Hmm. I would certainly start with the picosecond laser. And as a general rule, even though I love femtosecond lasers, as a general rule, uh, picosecond lasers are available in higher output powers. The cost is less in the dollars per watt sense. And so, you know, it, well, whenever we look at a new application, we say, can we do it with a nanosecond laser? If we can, we do. If not, we say, can we use a picosecond laser? Again, if we can do that, we do it. And if not, we go to the femtosecond laser as, a, as the laser of last choice. So my recommendation would be the fundamental picosecond wavelength, at least as a, as a start. In cold, cold roll uh, steel sheet, one quarter inch, is this a good application? Nope. Nope. Quarter inch, uh, way, way, way too thick for anything uh, in this range. Up to a millimeter, maybe in some cases, but really beyond a millimeter in thickness, um, these kind of lasers are not going to be useful. You have not mentioned much about marking. Can uh, FS lasers be used for material marking? Well, the answer is, in principle, they can be used, but there's two caveats. The first one is that the peak power is so high but generally, it's hard to get, a, to get a color change. What you get is a material removal. So if you want an etched mark, that can be done, but it's very hard to get a color change because of the short wavelength. Um, having said that, though, there are some materials which respond very well and very differently to the short pulse lasers. And so in principle, you can make some marks that you can't make with any other lasers, but you just have to remember that most marking lasers, you know, cost maybe somewhere between ten and a hundred thousand dollars for the whole thing, whereas a femtosecond laser just for the light bulb, you're talking about three hundred thousand dollars. So it's got to be a, a high value marking application. Referring to the high quality holes in metal that you showed a few slides back. Were they beam entrance holes or exit holes? They were exit holes. There's always a taper associated with laser processing, such as the entrance hole is somewhat bigger than the exit hole. And since most of the time when a customer asks me, uh, drill a, for instance, 20 micron hole, we have to specify something. We, we specify the smallest diameter, not the biggest. When do you use a picosecond laser rather than a femtosecond laser? Um, the answer is always, unless you have to use the femtosecond laser. The price of a femtosecond laser is very high, especially for a, we're starting a new project. How can I gain access to FS lasers for initial trials to justify a future laser or laser system purchase? Yeah, that's a good question, and you know, companies like mine exist for that very reason. We have nanosecond lasers with all three wavelengths. We have picosecond lasers with all three wavelengths. We have femtosecond lasers with all three wavelengths. It's very, very doubtful that any company is going to have that sort of thing. So basically my recommendation is to um, use contract manufacturers that have these kind of lasers and, and rent their facilities or rent time with them or send them samples so that they can help you to identify which laser would be best for you. In general, what are the typical rep rates being used for micro-machining applications, and in what applications would you see one megahertz being usable today? In general, the lasers usually have their peak power somewhere between, say, 30 kilohertz and 500 kilohertz. And so that's the range in which probably 95-plus percent of the micromachining applications are done. Now, all of these lasers that I'm aware of are running at tens of megahertz repetition rate internally, and we're just using external pulse pickers to pick off uh, the, the, the pulses that we want, basically, and in most cases amplify those picked pulses. 
So, in principle, it's possible to go to those high repetition rates, but in general, over a megahertz, then you have to start using either really fast galbos or these uh, polygons or some of these other devices. And those things are very useful for very specific applications, but they're not general tools. They're kind of like beam homogenizers. Beam homogenizers are really great for specific applications, but they're generally designed for a specific application, and it's not something you simply stick in the beam and leave it in there for everything. That's all the questions we have time for. If you still have questions, feel free to email me directly at pworsniak at sme.org. You can connect with our team here at Fabtech. Uh, in Chicago, November 9th through 11th. And we encourage you to stop by our website, advancedmanufacturing.org. Thanks for joining us for this Advanced Manufacturing Media Webinar. We hope you found it informative.